Father in heaven, Lord, we invite you to be with us now. We wait for that day till the world is filled with your glory. Fill us now with that glory here today together. Be with us now. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Dennis and Sager, and for those of you who may not know me, I am the Iowa Missouri Conference Youth Director. I bring you greetings from 1005 Grand Avenue in West Des Moines. Glad to be here this morning and uh, with all the brave souls, foolhardy souls, <laughs> willing to brave the weather to be here together to worship. Thank you for being here. Those of you that are on the home team, you may be looking around and seeing people dressed in uh, tan and or khaki and black. You may know what that is. It's our Pathfinder clubs that are here for our area level Pathfinder Bible experience event. For those of you who may not be aware with Pathfinders, it's kind of like a co-ed Boy Scout, Girl Scout group that uh, is for uh, young people aged 10 to 17. We do have a younger, younger club or a club for younger people. And you may see some of them running around. I saw some up here at Children's Story. That's our adventurer club uh, for children aged nine, four to nine. And uh, so I see a lot of familiar faces from Pathfinders, from Adventurers, and from Summer Camp. Um, I just want to invite you back. We're scheduled to start at two, but I know we do have some clubs that are coming from a little bit of a distance away. And uh, I see a Tumwa's made it. And it looks like maybe Des Moines here. I think we got a Des Moines Spanish club. Part of Des Moines is here, maybe. Uh, Two o'clock is our scheduled start time, um, and so if our clubs are here at that point, we'll start. Uh, we invite you back if you want to come and keep track and see how poorly you do against the Pathfinders. <laughs> you're welcome to do that. We'd be glad to have you here. Um, you may not know quite about Pathfinder Bible Experience. You may have heard of Bible Bowl. Uh, it's basically a quiz, quiz type program. This year's book uh, out of the Bible that we're studying is the book of Luke. Uh, also, questions may come from the introduction to the SDA Bible commentary on the book of Luke. So, uh, Pathfinders get to study both of those things. Teams can have up to seven people, one's an alternate, six at a time are involved in answering questions. There's 90 questions, and they can be pretty direct and uh, specific to one verse out of all the verses in the book of Luke and the introduction to the SDA Bible commentary. Um, it starts with an area level event, which is what we're here to do this week. In two weeks, those who score high enough will go to Sunnydale for the conference level event. And then third weekend in February, those who do well at their local conferences will go to the union level event in Lincoln, Nebraska. And then those who score high enough there will go on to the uh, North American division event. And those who score well there will go to the intergalactic event. <laughs> Just kidding, there's no real intergalactic event. Uh, <laughs> You must purchase your own ticket. Um, we've been fortunate from Iowa, Missouri. This program started, I believe, in 2011. And ever since 2011, Iowa, Missouri has always been represented at the North America Division. And from every year since then, except for one, we've had a first place finish. Uh, we believe that you kind of are going against not one another, so there's not one first place finish. There's Whoever has the top score sets the benchmark, and then if you're within 10% of that, you can get a first place. And the next 10% will be second, and then below that's a third place. So there can be several first place finishes, there can be all first place finishes, but there's always guaranteed to be one. Um, but we've always been fortunate and had, except for one year, a, at least one first place team at the North American Division. And competition there can be pretty tight. Um, I've sat on the judging committee, I believe, every year but two. I serve as a judge at the North American Division event. And my job one year, this is as crazy as this sounds, my job one year, there was a team that had scored initially a 100%. They had not missed a single point in the entire 160 points that were possible, 90 questions, two hours of testing. And my job, I know this is going to sound like a lot of fun, was to go back through and verify that they had, had, had in fact, answered every question correctly. And they had. And there was no doubt. It was, it was a proud moment for that team. Um, and and a, just cool to see Pathfinders so excited about the Bible that they've studied it that much that I'm pretty sure almost every team there could have sat down with a piece of paper and a pen and written out the books of Esther and Daniel. Um, I'm pretty sure that will happen again this year. Most of the clubs that are going to be here 
could probably almost write out the book of Luke for you this afternoon if we asked them to do that because they've memorized the scriptures that much. Um, so we're excited about that. We're excited about Pathfinders that'll be here today and their, their excitement about learning the Bible. And of course, we know that's not the end of it. We don't study the Bible just to know the Bible. We use, we use the, what we've learned to share and bless the world around us. But that's where we start. Uh, speaking of Pathfinders, we have several events coming up, and you may not know much about Pathfinders, so I would like to help you learn about Pathfinders today. Um, around our conference, we have a lot of clubs. Um, churches will get together and make a club, or sometimes churches like here in Cedar Rapids are big enough to have their own club. So uh, we have events that we sponsor from the conference level as, a, as well as things that your local club will do here. Uh, the next one, the big one coming up is Honors Weekend. That'll be the first weekend in March, and the clubs from Iowa will get together, and they will study a certain subjects, and they'll learn enough about it that they earn what's called an honor patch. So they've got a little bit of specialized knowledge about certain things. As you look at people's different uh, sashes, you'll see some have none yet. They haven't, they haven't earned any honors quite yet. They're, they're new. Others will have sashes full. I saw a picture from the South American division. The guy's, the guy's sash was about as wide as he was, plus 50% more, um, full of sashes. It was a joke sash, but it was full of every sash available in the entire general conference. Um, you won't see that here, but as you look around at your Pathfinders, you'll see lots of different things. And typically, like this one has a set of music notes on it, uh, that's for the music honor. Uh, let's see, I got one with a dude in a canoe, and that's for the canoeing honor. Good. So most of the time, you can kind of figure out what they're for, but it'd be a good way to, to speak to a young person today to just ask about an honor and see what they've learned in the process of, of earning that honor. Uh, our Iowa Missouri Conference Camp is the first weekend in May. Normally, it's good weather. About three years ago, four years ago, we had snow. You never know what's going to happen. So, uh, so all of our Pathfinders will all get together in May and have a good time. Uh, yeah, so it's a great time to get together, see other youth, learn more about Jesus. Every five years, there's a very special event called the Oshkosh Camporee. This August is year number five. So Pathfinder clubs from around the world will be meeting in Oshkosh, Wis Oshkosh Wisconsin. Uh, the international tickets to that event are already sold out. There are no more international tickets to be had. So uh, I believe it was 2,500 or 3,000. Those are all sold out. I think they sold actually 3,200 tickets for international. Those are sold out. There's still some left for North America Division. Um, it's going to be a big event, 50,000 young people there for the week. Uh, just having a good time, earning honors, getting to know each other, listening to nighttime programming. Uh, it'll be a great time for Pathfinders. Uh, and then again in September, Leadership Weekend, right back here, so all of your leaders from your club can get together, learn from other Pathfinder leaders, learn from people in classes, and uh, come back and make your local club stronger. Speaking of Camp Heritage, in just a few months, summer camp starts back up at Camp Heritage, and uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about Camp Heritage before we get going here this morning. We just took up an offering, and part of that offering goes to help support the ministry that happens at Camp Heritage. Um, <coughs> So thank you for that, for participating in that offering. Camp Heritage is located on Lake of the Ozarks in, I guess you could call southwestern Missouri, about two hours outside of Kansas City. We're located on the lake. It has more shoreline, I've heard, than California has coastline. So of course we do a lot of water activities, boating, swimming, canoeing, um, all those kinds of things. But we also have horseback riding and archery, rock climbing, ceramics, crafts, model rockets, and many other uh, activities for campers to pursue. We also have morning and evening worship in our campfire program. When I arrived in 2011, we had 242 campers that first summer. And then last summer, 2018, we had 524 campers uh, across, our, across our weeks last summer. Uh, we're really excited because that means more campers are getting to hear the story of Jesus. There are, this may surprise you, there are 59 Adventist summer camps across the North America division. You may have heard that before or you may not have. Approximately 30,000 campers attend summer camp every year in our Adventist summer camps, at those 59 summer camps. Uh, in December, last month, at the Association of Adventist Camp Professionals National Conference held this year down in Camp Colaqua in Florida, uh, they presented awards for specific categories, they presented awards of excellence, and then they presented an award for Camp of the Year. And I am proud to stand here and say, our Camp Heritage was named 2018's AACP Camp of the Year. Yeah. 
And I consider that an award that belongs to all of us because in some way or another, most likely we've all done something to help advance the mission that happens at camp. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, we're very proud of that, but of course, uh, we'll still be the same old Camp Heritage when you come. <laughs> we won't get a big head, we promise. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit us at campheritage.org for more information. And if you'd like to bring your camper, I saw a couple campers here this morning. If you'd like to bring a camper, send a camper. Uh, April 1, it's a real easy day to remember. It's April Fool's, but it's not a joke. Our registration opens on that day, um, April 1. I just want to tell you a couple stories from camp. Um, you know, we go all week, and we consider camp to be like a large evangelistic series. Um, and at the end of the week, we do a commitment card that people get to fill out, and campers can make the commitments they want to, whether that's start a prayer life, start reading the Bible more, um, Bible studies, family worship, whatever they want. But before we do that, we take them around some kind of uh, either a walk through the Bible or we have a play or something, a passion play that demonstrates and talks about Jesus. And this last summer, we were doing one during teen camp, and it started to rain before we could take the kids out and go on our little uh, station to station thing. So we had them all together in one in, in, in the chapel together. And I, I, my job was to present the commitment card and ask kids if they wanted to make a commitment to Jesus somehow. And I was explaining the different options and I got to, uh, I would like to have family worship when I get home. I've enjoyed having family worship here, but I'd like to in, enjoy that at home too. And I talked about the story of the little maid, the little maid that was captured by the Assyrian army. Captain Naaman was the guy that, that was the recipient of her and she came and cleaned house. Uh, of course, Naaman was the guy from the Assyrian army that got leprosy and was sent to, well, he was in trouble because it was pretty much, it's leprosy. And in that day and age, you're not getting away from that. Uh, the little maid shared the story of how her prophet back home could heal him. He trusted her, went, was healed, and came back home. And I talked about the witness you can be in your household when you get home. And if you've had a good time here and had good family worship, and you want to have family worship back home, when you get home... Go to your mom and dad and say, look, I had a good time having family worship at camp, and I'd really like to have that experience here with you guys at home. And your parents will, will honor that and respect that. And I didn't find out until about two months later the, the rest of the story from this, for this one young lady. She uh, showed back up at church. Her family had not been coming to church for a while. They had disengaged from church little by little until they had finally disappeared. Don't let that happen here. If you see someone starting to slip out the door, grab on with everything you've got. Anyway, they had slipped out of the church, and all of a sudden, one weekend, she and her family showed back up. And one of the ladies of the church saw them and ran up, gave her a hug, said, hey, it's great to have you here. And as they continued the discussion, she said, what brought you back to church this week? And she said, well, uh, I, I got home from camp, and I told my mom and dad, mom and dad, you're going to start taking me back to church. And there she was. And not only did she tell her, you're going to take me back to church, she also said, I'm going to go to Sunnydale and you're going to take me. And she's at Sunnydale Academy right now this year as a student. I don't know if my talk that night had anything to do with that at all. I'd like to think it did, but I don't know that it did. God sometimes takes what you say and changes it around into something good. So hopefully that happened there. Just a great story about things that happen at camp. Uh, we also had another camp, camp staff member. I'm going to test out my, yeah, there we go. Another staff member, she had a cabin full of girls, and uh, as the week had gone on, she'd had a little bit of a struggle with this and that. Friday night came, they went back to the cabin to talk about things, and campers just started asking questions. Tell me about God. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. And she just kept praying and kept answering questions as she went, and then they all went to sleep that night. And that week, it's Sunday, when we had our staff meeting, she was telling about it, she said, you know, it was really an awesome opportunity, and I feel like God really used me. And it felt like as I was answering all of those questions, as one would come up and then another would come up, it felt like God had been preparing me my entire life for that moment. And the opportunity that our staff member had to share with those campers was just a life-changing thing in her, a life-changing moment in her, in her experience. And of course, the campers that were there enjoyed that too. Um, as part of our Friday night play, a lot of times there's a scene with Jesus on the cross or the resurrection or something like that. And this summer we sure, 
sure enough had that. One of our young staff was playing the part of Jesus, and that involved being on the cross, but it also involved the second scene later of the resurrection. And so he had to run back and forth. And he was, he was playing the part, hanging on the cross, trying to play dead, but still trying to see what's happening, you know, looking out in the crowd, trying to see what's going on. And he saw a little boy walk up towards the foot of the cross. And so he stayed dead, but he, but he looked down, and he was kind of watching the little boy, and he saw the little boy look up at him with these big old eyes. And he said, he did that for me. And in that moment, that camper caught a vision of the true sacrifice Christ made. And in that moment, our staff member caught a true vision of the sacrifice Christ had made. So not only was a camper heart changed, but also a young staff member, still in high school, who's now got a vision for the passion that Jesus had for us. And now takes that with him back to his school to help impact people there. So yeah, really cool things happen at camp. And we're here for a really cool event today. Pathfinder's been studying diligently for the past several months for today's Pathfinder Bible experience covering the book of Luke. And in just a moment, we're going to take a look at a story from the book of Luke. But before that, I just want to pray. Uh, so if you'd join me for a moment, that'd be cool. Father in heaven, Lord, I just invite you to be here with me. I invite you to take over uh, this talk. Lord, if I say uh, words that are not your message, I just pray you would change it and put a new one in, your, in our ears. Lord, speak to us today. In your name I pray, amen. We're going to take a look at a story that comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10. So if you want to take a look at Luke 10, we'll start at verse 25. I'll read it up here in case we don't have one together. Luke 10, verse 25, and we'll also read 26 to start with. Is it good to see your young people up in front? Amen. Leading out, yeah, that is so cool. So thank you to those of you who helped out singing and reading the scripture and uh, offering call and all the things that we did this morning. Thank you guys for your service today. Luke 10, 25 says, and I'm going to be in the New King James Version because that's the closest I have to the Pathfinder Bible. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what's written in the law? What is your reading of it? Lawyer of the law of Moses had been sent out to trick Jesus, to trap Jesus, to get Jesus to say something that could be used against him. The religious leaders of the day were looking for something to use to discredit Jesus. And this was a pretty common occurrence. The religious leaders trying this day to prove their point, Jesus didn't support and respect the law. So this lawyer was sent to try and get Jesus to say something that could be used against him. But Jesus didn't play along. He didn't play the game that day. Instead, he asked the student of the law how he interpreted it. So he asked for the law to speak to the young man's question. The lawyer answers Jesus next in verse 27. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus evaluates the lawyer's answer in the next verse, verse 28. He said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. The lawyer nailed it. The lawyer had summarized the law given to Moses. The Ten Commandments we talked a little bit earlier this morning can be, can be separated into two parts. Numbers one through four deal with our relationship with God. They deal with that relationship that goes this way, vertically, between us and God. No other gods before me. Don't make a graven image. Don't take my name in vain. Remember my Sabbath day. Those commandments all have to do with our relationship with God. And then from there, commandments 5 through 10 help us relate with people. They teach us how to relate with those around us, our vertical vision, those that we live with here. The lawyer had passed his own test. But it doesn't seem that was enough for the long, young lawyer. Perhaps he was wanting to save some face. Perhaps he wanted to keep going to try and get more words out of Jesus that could be used later. Perhaps he was being paid on a contingency basis. He'd only get paid if he could get the goods out of Jesus. Verse 29 says, But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? See, there was a big debate that the Jewish leaders loved to have with each other. They loved to engage in this debate about who was a neighbor. Certain people clearly were our neighbor. And other people certainly were not our neighbor. So there's this gray ground in the middle. 
Trying to define where that line was drawn as to who qualified as a neighbor was a favorite religious discussion point of the day. So Jesus answers this young man's question, again, not with a direct answer, but rather a story and another question. I wish I had a teleport machine that I could go back sometimes and witness some of these events that happen. I wish I could go and hear Jesus tell this story. Um, but I don't have a time machine. I'm never going to be able to afford a time machine if one were available. But I thought it'd be kind of fun to watch a short video. I don't know if it's up. Yeah, you can see it behind me, right? I thought it'd be kind of fun to watch this. I thought it was a, a neat visual demonstration of the parable Jesus said. So let's play that parable, and then we'll pick it back up after that. Powerful video, huh? I wonder if those guys ever met again. If they didn't, I'd love to be there when they meet, when Jesus comes back. You guys likely know that this story is a well, has a well-known name, the Good Samaritan. It's a famous story. In fact, our legal system across the United States and around the world, there are, there are laws called Good Samaritan laws. This is not the first of those laws, but in China in 2006, an aged woman fell as she was trying to board a bus, breaking a hip. A bystander, Peng Yu, came to her aid, helping her to a hospital. Later on, you know, hospital bills mount. The woman and her family sued Peng Yu, claiming he had caused her to fall. Although the woman had no evidence to back up her assertion, the judge ruled in her favor, deciding that Peng Yu must have been motivated to help the woman because he had caused the accident, as no one would help another just to be kind. Sad. After this ruling, many injured Chinese people began suing those who tried to help them, and innocent rescuers were often found guilty. Consequently, people stopped offering assistance to those in need, and it wasn't until an injured child was left to die that the city of Shenzhen passed China's first Good Samaritan law in 2013. It then became, it then became a national law in 2017. So, I think we're familiar with the story. If not, we just saw it. This poor man is attacked by robbers. They strip him, they beat him nearly to death, and leave him there in the road. And then, by pure luck, who happens by? A priest, a man of the cloth, a spiritual leader, a spiritual leader in the entire community. Finally, help has arrived. But no, the religious leader moves to the other side of the road and leaves the poor man beaten, bloody, dirty empty-handed and unable to help himself in the dirt road where donkeys travel, where camels travel. Apparently a little time goes by and here comes a second man. This time a Levite. He's from the tribe that the religious leaders are selected from. He's a descendant of Aaron. Finally his help has arrived. As the poor man listens, the footsteps get closer and closer and closer. Then they've passed him. Further, further, further away they go until they can be heard no more. How can it be? This man needs help. If a priest hasn't helped and a Levite hasn't helped, is there any chance this man will find any help before it's too late? Then there's the faint sound of another traveler coming down the trail. The man musters the energy to take a look. Oh, fiddlesticks. It's a Samaritan. There's no way in the world he's going to help. The poor beaten man is a Jew. The poor Israelite's probably about to give up all hope. But then for some reason, the Samaritan traveler stops. He stoops down. He cleans the man's wounds. He stops the bleeding. I picture the man rendering all the first aid that he knows to give. I envision him putting clothes on the man, maybe his very own clothes, to preserve this man's dignity. He puts him on his own donkey and heads to the nearest inn. His own journey is put on hold in order to help this poor, beaten down man, a man who, in his culture, is his enemy. The Samaritan spends the night tending to the poor, unfortunate soul. In the morning, he leaves to continue his journey. But before leaving, he hires the innkeeper to keep watch over the injured man. He gives money to the innkeeper to cover the expenses, and he promises to reimburse him for any future expenses that that money doesn't cover. And with that, Jesus' story ends. Ellen White indicates in, this, in her writings that this is a true story that was fresh in the minds of those that were there. 
people knew the situation Jesus had described. And this story comes to an end. As it comes to an end, Jesus answers the lawyer's question with a question of his own in verse 36. Verse 36 says, so which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And the lawyer answers in verse 37, he said, he who showed mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. The lawyer couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. He could only muster he who showed mercy on him. I was at the Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Central States pastors meetings this past week. They all came together to have one set of meetings. And someone there said, grace and mercy aren't really grace and mercy until they're given to someone who will never be in a position to pay it back. Grace and mercy aren't really grace and mercy until they're given to someone who will not be in a position to pay it back. Several years ago, I was a summer staff member at Camp Heritage, and it was the, the day between teen camp and teen canoe camp. And we had campers staying over, and they would eat lunch with the staff when it was time for lunch. And I sat down, I was enjoying my lunch, uh, and the teens came in to have their lunch as we were, you know, done going through line. And there was a young man there, had hair, I'm not sure what color it was, somewhere between a blue and a purple. Um, he had been there for a, for a week, and he was staying over, so he was eating there. Um, you could tell he needed attention. Uh, as the campers went through line and found their seats, all of a sudden you could hear the noise of a plate hitting the ground, food spilling, tray going to the ground. Fortunately, there was no round of applause, as happens many times in that situation. And I sat there thinking, oh my goodness, this poor guy. He's already self-conscious and now he's dropped his tray. Man, somebody needs to help him out. And while I was sitting there thinking that, I took the time to look over and there was our friend Amy, already out of her seat, helping the young man pick his stuff up. She had taken the moment to get out of her chair and extend help to someone who needed it. In that moment of embarrassment, in that moment of need, in that moment of I just want to crawl under a table and die, Amy had gotten out of her chair and helped this young man salvage what was left. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who left, who fell among the thieves? Jesus' message to the lawyer, to the crowd, was not an answer to the question of who is my neighbor, but it was rather a command to quit worrying about who qualifies as a neighbor and focus on you being a good neighbor. It's not your job to figure out who your neighbor is. It's your job to be the neighbor. That all sounds really well and good when we read it in the pages of our Bibles or we highlight it on our mobile device or we tweet it or we make a pretty design with it and post it on Instagram. But then we walk out of church or we walk into our classrooms or we go to our job and we forget to actually put it into action. We forget that story's for us. There are real tri trials out there. Thursday, August 18, 2001. In my family, that day will always be referred to as Black Thursday. That's the day I was in the gym doing my job, and the phone rang, and the voice on the other end said, hey, we need you to come up to the principal's office for a minute. <laughs> Happened at about 3.37, give or take a minute or two. <laughs> I'm not bitter. <laughs> Made it to the principal's office. As I opened the door and I saw the principal, the education superintendent, the treasurer of the conference, and the conference vice president all sitting there. I didn't have the greatest feeling in the world of what was about to happen. I sat down and they explained to me that, well, I don't know, I heard not enough students, budget shortfall, got to make a cut, and you're it. And starting tomorrow, your services are no longer needed here at our school. It was a sad day. And I don't know that I necessarily felt anger at the time, but it was a rough pill to swallow. A few months, several months go by, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska, driving my car. 
Church had ended. We were headed for, I'm not really sure where we were headed. But we were driving back, and it was raining a little bit. It was misting. It wasn't really raining, it was misting. Not a, not a happy day. And I looked over, and there was the man who had given me the message I no longer had a job, walking in the mist, in the middle of nowhere. I knew where his house was. It was clear across town. We drove by, and I asked my wife to verify that that's who it was, and it was. So I turned around, and I went back, and I pulled over, and I said, hey, where are you going? So I'm walking home. Why are you walking home? I locked my keys in my car. We need a ride? And dumbfounded, the man said, well, well, yeah, I could use a ride. So I hopped in, and we drove him home. Doing right when you've been done wrong. In our everyday lives, we can encounter people who don't think like us, they don't look like us, they don't act like us, they don't drive like us, they don't drive as good as us, <laughs> they don't dress like us, maybe they dress better than us, they don't believe the same as us, and they sure don't sin the same as us. Surely they can't be considered a neighbor, right? Right? But Jesus says it's not your job to figure out who to be nice to. It's simply your job to be nice. It's not your job to, to determine who qualifies to be treated as a neighbor. It's your job to be the neighbor. It's your job to show love to everybody. And God doesn't place a boundary on where our neighbor is from, what color our neighbor is, what smell our neighbor has. It doesn't matter if the person's red, yellow, black, or white. It doesn't matter if they live in the White House or the Poor House. It doesn't matter if they cheer for the Bears, the Vikings, the Chiefs, the Broncos, or even the New England Patriots. They might be a Cyclone, they might be a Hawkeye. It doesn't matter if they're Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, or Green Party. It doesn't matter if their diet's organic, raw, vegan, lacto-ovo, vegetarian, carnivore, or cannibal. <laughs> God's love and God's mercy extends to everybody. And we're called to extend that love and mercy to all. And Pathfinders, we're here today. This afternoon, we're going to be checking your ability to remember and recall information from God's word from the book of Luke. And that's a good thing. But you can never let a knowledge of God's word take the place of living out God's word. You can never let a knowledge of God's word take the place of living out God's word. Thank you. Others that are here today, you're not off the hook. I'm going to pause for just a second before we finish up. We're about to wind down, but we're not quite there yet. I just want to pause for a moment, and I want you to think and identify who it might be that maybe God is calling you to minister to in your life. Maybe you've previously determined that there's someone who doesn't qualify to be your neighbor. Or maybe it's a whole group of someones. Or maybe you just want to be in your chair for a moment just to pray quietly that Jesus would open your eyes to see someone, someone near you this week, maybe even today, someone who needs to see and experience Jesus' love. You are his hands and feet today. So for just a moment, I'm going to stop and give you a chance right there where you are to think and pray just for probably about one minute. Just pray with Jesus and see who it is. As you, as, if you were to look around and think of that one person, the most undeserving person, the most undeserving person you can, keep in mind Christ died for them exactly the same as he died for you. So I'm going to pause for just a moment and let you have that moment with Jesus here before we leave because I find for myself, I hear a good sermon. Hopefully this is one of them. But I hear, I hear an idea. And I forget it by the time lunch is over. So I'm going to stop for just a moment right now so we can take that moment and think for ourselves, God, what are you calling me to? Who are you calling me to minister to? And if you can't think of that person, pray for God to put them in your life. Amen. That's an awkward minute, huh? <laughs> well, we're about done. I cannot stop this morning, however, without pointing out what I think is probably possibly the most awesome part of the story of the Good Samaritan. 
and you think we've covered it all. As we finish up our look at the story from the book of Luke, I just want to step back and get the big, big picture. Today we read of a traveler left to die with no hope in sight. He had been beaten, stripped, left for dead. He was unable to remedy his own situation. He was unable to provide for his own rescue. Then someone came along, saw his hopeless situation, and stopped what they were doing. Stooped down to pick up the helpless human, cleaned him up, and provided for his restoration. Does that sound like another story you may have heard? Yeah, the story of salvation. To me, that sounds an awful lot like what Jesus has done exactly for us. He's come along, he's found us in our hopeless state. The book of Romans reminds us that we're all sinners, and the, and the price for that, the penalty for sin is death. But Jesus has paid that price for us. He's more than willing to pick you up, to rescue you, to clean you up, even though we have no way to repay him. He extends his grace and his mercy to us every single day. We've done nothing to earn it. We can't pay it back. But he offers us redemption today. Since we've so freely received from him, he's given us that redemption. We're going to freely give it to those we find around us today. If you want to receive that redemption today, whether for the first time or just to renew that relationship with Jesus, I invite you to stand as we sing. And when, as uh, Mark and his group comes up, if you want to receive that redemption today, whether it's for the first time or you just want to say to God, I want that redemption, please clean me up and fix me and put me back on the right track, I invite you to stand now. And then maybe, Mark, you can invite the rest of us to stand as we sing. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the victory you've given to us. We thank you that you saw our, our position. You came to us, you've rescued us, you've put us on the right track. Thank you, Lord, so much for that. Help us to remember the story that you gave to this lawyer, to this crowd. It's not our job to figure out who's worthy of your love like we were. It's just our job to love. Give us that vision. Give us your vision today and moving forward. Lord, we thank you for being with us here. We pray for safety on the roads. Thank you for those uh, who are still headed here. Be with them. Keep them safe. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for extending your grace to us and help us to extend it to those around us. Thank you, Lord. Happy Sabbath. Amen.